Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. More on them a little bit later. There have been many, many robot copies of Sonic the Hedgehog throughout the franchise's history, but very rarely are they ever actually on the side of good. I mean, why bother? We already have the original. But have you ever wondered what would happen if one of Sonic's oldest enemies turned against Robotnik and joined Sonic? What would happen if a dark mirror character became like, I don't know, like a nice mirror, I guess? A mirror that thought your style was so good it would be inspired to improve itself, even though the mirror does have some superior powers and different abilities, and really it's more kind of coming into its own identity as a mirror, so I, okay, this metaphor is falling apart, but that is exactly what happened with the subject of today's video. Meet Shard, the Metal Sonic, or the Mecha Sonic. Bear with me, the naming is gonna get real confusing today. A lot of fans might only know him for his brief stint during the late era run of Archie Sonic, but believe it or not, Shard is one of the longest running characters in the record breaking run of this comic series. And I'm gonna be honest, I spent most of my time not liking him at all, wanting him to be the character I was promised from the games and then always let down with what they gave me. But all that time, I didn't realize he was evolving into something truly special. In a lot of ways, Shard is a more true copy of Sonic compared to any other Metal Sonic out there. This robot has all the wit and speed of the vanilla fleshy version, and he appeared alongside the clandestine group of secret freedom fighters, acting as the comic relief of the group, but also as one of their powerhouses when you consider all of his amazing abilities. With his Mega Man arm cannon, which can transform and serve a multiple set of uses, throwing out nets or hammers or shovels, drills, so yeah, really is a Mega Man arm. Outside of the energy projectiles he could shoot out not only from his arm but from his chest, Shard was able to move as fast if not faster than the real Sonic. And that's not even mentioning the durability of his metal body, which can also heal itself. So yeah, he was pretty powerful, to the point he could be considered broken. And at one point, he certainly was, but I am getting ahead of myself. Considering the capability of this robot alone, and then pairing that up with other amazing allies, including another major powerhouse in Silver the Hedgehog, you'd think he would be unstoppable, or at the very least, the center of attention in these stories. I mean, come on, Sonic fans love stuff like this. And yeah, he definitely had his moments to shine, and certainly had a bit more attention compared to some of the other members of the Secret Freedom Fighters. But for the few stories they had together, it really was mostly Silver and Elias's show. Still, it's in these stories where fans really fell in love with the character, and when he did have the spotlight on him in Sonic Universe, brief as it was, he did not let us down. But before we dive into the character proper, I do think his journey to becoming Shard only elevates that story. So we need to go back to the early days of Archie, and to one of the most important issues they would ever release for the series. Shard is actually the original Metal Sonic of Archie's canon, first seen in the seminal 25th issue, which itself was a milestone with in its own right. But a proper breakdown of that issue will have to wait for another time. Right now, we need to keep our focus solely on Metal Sonic, or as he's known here, Mecha Sonic. I told you, naming was gonna get confusing and we're just getting started. Back then, Sega of America didn't seem to have a firm grasp on the naming of these Sonic bots. And as a kid, I just rolled with it because I thought Mecha sounded cooler. Anyway, Mecha Sonic, as we will call him here for now, is clearly different from the game series version of Metal Sonic. First off, he talks. He does speak as a cold, sinister robot, except for the times he makes the occasional pun. But to be fair, this was a Mike Gallagher script, so it's just expected. Puns were just the first language in any of this guy's scripts. And Mike, bless his heart, did hold back as much as he could when it came to Mecha Sonic, who does mostly talk as an emotionless robot, but still occasionally talks smack to Sonic from time to time during their famous race. And outside of that, some of the physical designs are different from the game version. The art team didn't get much in terms of reference material from Sega, as not only is the name incorrect, but so are the quills. Archie's Mecha Sonic only has two instead of the standard three, and that famous mouth from the American cover of Sonic CD is also here. All the same, I would still argue that this first version of Mecha Sonic still looks pretty cool, as it's all held together by Spaziante's detailed art. And when compared to any other robot in the Archie series prior to this point, Mecha Sonic just looks so much cooler, even if his head shape is a little weird when you look at it from the front. It's just not that big of a deal. Little tiny hiccups that could be easily corrected the next time Metal Sonic showed up. He wasn't as common as he is today, but Metal is still 
still a staple of the game series. I'm sure the Archie series would correct the name and other silly mistakes the next time he dropped a... Before we jump into the next issue, let's talk about that project you've been holding off on for far too long. You know the one, that comprehensive gallery of pizza-themed underwear. Or maybe you're trying to sell some pizza-themed underwear, and you need an online storefront. Or perhaps you need to put a menu online for your local restaurant which sells underwear-themed pizza. <laughs> What am I talking about? <laughs> okay, maybe your ambitions aren't quite that weird, or maybe they are. Either way, this is where our friends at Squarespace come in. I've personally always been intimidated at the idea of getting my own domain and my own little slice of the internet, but it took me just a handful of minutes to get down the basics once I checked out Squarespace myself. It really is that easy. They walk you through everything. And after that, it was just super fun customizing everything to my heart's content. Heck, if you already have a domain name, you could just transfer it over with their easy to use tools and do whatever you want with it. And if you're wanting to take whatever project you're working on seriously, the tools to track your growth, put together your own ad campaigns, integrate with social media platforms, everything you need to be a functioning business is right here and just as easy to understand. It's very little effort to get something clean and professional up in front of the world. Trust me, nothing feels quite as cool as having your own domain on a business card. And to make it even easier, if you head over to squarespace.com slash game apologist, you will get 10% off your first purchase. Thank you again to Squarespace for supporting the channel, and let's get back to it. Archie's Mechasonic would return in the Knuckles Chaotix 48-page special. And yes, we have talked about it before. And yes, I still hate this look. But again, I see what they are trying to do here. This Mechasonic would grow big and red, and this design better matches. And truth be told, ever since I released my Chaotix video, I have seen some amazing fan art really sprucing up this particular look. But good god, show Show me a bigger town crate. This just does not compare to the classic Metal Sonic design. But little credit where it's due. I always found it strange that Metal Sonic was the antagonist set up against Knuckles and the rest of the Chaotix. In the game itself, he doesn't really do anything you'd expect a robot copy of Sonic to do. And at least in the comic, Mecha doesn't look quite as streamlined and speedy as he did the first time around. He's instead a little more beefed up, which is fitting to match against a depowered Knuckles. And thanks to his new newly implanted power gem, it looks like he can take a bit more damage when taking on the rest of the Chaotix team, which Robotnik had not planned for. Personality-wise, it's still mostly just a mean, cold robot, nothing really noteworthy on that front, but the second appearance is still important because of that aforementioned power gem. Not only does it allow Mecha Sonic to transform into that big, red, nasty version, but it also allows him to survive after Knuckles takes him out. After the Chaotix special, we would not see Mecha Sonic for a good long while, at least not this particular robot. And just like the game series itself, Metal Sonic would basically go missing until the release of Sonic Adventure. Archie not only adapted that game in its own weird way, but they also made use out of the two robot cameos from that game. It's well trodden ground on the channel at this point, but the Mecha Sonic Mark III would be used and named as Silver Sonic 2, and he would have a whole issue dedicated to fighting Sonic, but as any fan of Sonic Adventure already knows, the other robot that cameoed in that game would be Metal Sonic. And the very next month after they dealt with Silver Sonic 2, we would see the return of Archie's version of that character. I haven't mentioned it a great deal in previous videos since Metal Sonic is a constant mainstay character these days, but back in the day, it was a rare treat to see this wonderful robot, and I completely lost it when I came across Metal during my first playthrough of Sonic Adventure back in the day. And when I saw that Archie dedicated a whole issue to that junky Silver Sonic 2, I couldn't wait for that following month when we would see the long-awaited return of Mecha or Metal Sonic, whatever they were calling it. Considering how seriously they were taking Sonic Adventure and reorganizing all the canon to better match the games, I was sure this time they would get the design and name right. Surely they would right the wrongs of that hideous design from the Chaotix special. I mean, they stayed on model for Silver Sonic, and surely they couldn't do any worse than, oh Oh my god, how? So, yeah, this is the third appearance of Archie's Metal Sonic, who was actually named Metal Sonic this time around. But they still somehow screwed the name up. It's not two separate words. There's no space between Metal and Sonic. So Metal Sonic is just one word, and it's so weird to see these characters refer 
Howard was full name constantly throughout the story. That space is important. I mean, how am I supposed to pronounce it? Am I supposed to say Metal Sonic or Hydrocity? I was dipping in and out of Archie pretty hard at this point, but Metal has always been a favorite of mine, and I kept waiting for them to bring him back to that original design, but for me, this was the final straw. They made such a big deal out of his appearance in issue 25, so why on earth did they keep trying to change the design every time he came back? They were never going to match that original pristine Sonic CD version. This third time around, the iconic Crescent Quills are still gone, but now they don't even look like Sonic Quills. Now they are a single row of spines, kind of like the classic American Mohawk Quills, but they're also full, so they look like a row of traffic cones on his head. And those creepy red ring eyes are replaced with just standard red dots. He also has a fully functioning mouth with teeth. How does that even work with metal? And the rest of his body has this weird Mega Man-ish look to it. I suppose on its own, it's not that bad, but again, considering how lacking we were with Metal Sonic appearances, this was just offensive to me. It was clear they didn't understand or respect the character designs from the games. So at this point, I pretty much gave up on reading Archie. I mean, the stories were already going downhill anyway. I mean, they couldn't even match the design on the cover. Why does he have sharp teeth and white eyes here? It's bad enough they aren't consistent with the game designs, but they can't even keep it together between artists in the same book. So yeah, a lot of my opinions on the story were already formed simply because this wasn't the Metal Sonic I knew and loved from the games. But even after calming down on all of that years later, yeah, this isn't a brilliant story. But all the same, it does have interesting ideas. Metal Sonic had returned to take his revenge on the original Hedgehog, and not only that, he wanted to toy with Sonic. So he kidnapped Tails and placed him at the top of Mount Mobius, an active volcano that was about to erupt. And if I'm not mistaken, the same location as Sonic's Spinball, so that's pretty cool. You would think that Metal Sonic would want a proper race against Sonic, but thanks to that evolving power core, Metal already knew he outpaced the original, and not just in speed. This is where we would first see some of those new abilities, including shooting out nets, a bulldozer arm, shooting out lasers, and really, there didn't seem to be much this robot couldn't do. This Metal Sonic had really and truly grown to a point where Sonic never stood a chance against him. Metal had really and truly surpassed the original Hedgehog. And on that front, that made this confrontation interesting. Sonic is a powerhouse already, but here he has to face a copy of himself that was superior in just about every way. He couldn't rely on speed to get him and his friend out of this mess. But Metal Sonic had evolved not just in terms of appearance and physical abilities, but clearly he also now had a personality that wasn't there before. A personality that grew out of the programming that taught him to take down Sonic, sure, but he was still something more than just a mindless machine. He was vengeful, sure, but he was also snarky and sassy. He was becoming his own person, and Sonic, who had previously been forced into being a Mecha Sonic himself, tried to reason with that part of Metal, saying that he is more than just his programming. And even though Metal had the upper hand this entire time, after seeing Tails stand side by side with Sonic, even though they had no chance of escaping the erupting lava, Metal Sonic had a change of heart at the very last minute, now seeing the value of life. He held back the lava to the best of his ability, allowing the duo to flee. And yeah, the shift is pretty sudden, the art's a bit wonky, and this story certainly didn't need to be in two parts, but it was an interesting direction to take the robot. And if we left it right there, that would have still been plenty for us to dive into and pick apart. And later on, we would get a more game-accurate Metal Sonic in the series. And once he appeared, I thought that would be that for this original robot. Just sweep that wonky power gem version under the rug and carry on. But much later on, to my surprise, they instead dug the son of a gun back up, quite literally. As we would find out, Joffrey St. John and his team would dig the power gem out. And as it turned out, the core programming of Metal Sonic had fused with the thing. Sonic's Uncle Chuck would reluctantly be the one to put Metal Sonic back together. Obviously, they couldn't recover the entire body from the volcano, but the parts they did manage to scrap, as well as bits from other busted Metal Sonics and Metal Sonic Troopers and Metal Scourge, which yes, is a whole thing for another time, I'm sorry. Once all these scraps joined with the Power Gem Matrix, the body would begin to self-repair. A little bit too quickly for Chuck, since that was a frustration as it got in the way of his attempts at modification. And I imagine some of Chuck's mods include this stylish coloring. The blue had been replaced with black, as well as this lovely yellow sport striping. A fun reference to Sonic Rival 2's Metal 
Battle Sonic 3.0. And I gotta say, I think it looks much better on this dude. In fact, I had to admit, for the first time in any of these redesigns, this robot looked good. Real good. Yeah, there's that new paint job, but they also reworked the quills. And the proportions aren't all that different from his last appearance, but they are different all the same. I also like this neat little thing where his eyes turn from green to red, whether or not he's in battle mode. Really, when you think about it, there aren't that many changes from that last design, but these tweaks really go a long way for me. I think this looks amazing, but even with this new look, this robot's history had not been forgotten, especially by Uncle Chuck. Not only was he rebuilding this robot in secret, as the Kingdom of Acorn had fallen under the rule of Ixis Nagus, and I'm sorry if you don't know any of these names, we'll have to get to it another time in some Archie coverage, I promise, but Chuck was never going to take kindly to a robot who had attempted to kill his nephew on more than one occasion. And despite all the sass that Shard gives to Chuck, you can tell that still gets under his metal skin. He has a lot of regrets from his past, and as he explains, it was Sonic himself who helped show him a better way, that life mattered. It really seemed like this newly rebuilt robot wanted to make up for his past, and he was quick to show just that. After the Death Egg had launched an attack on Mobotropolis, the freshly formed secret freedom fighters would discreetly help save the city from Team Metal. And of course, the Metal Sonic of that group would be taken down in a flash by his older brother, stepping out of the shadow as a Sonic clone, and quite literally demolishing his past, smirking at the shattered remains of a face that was once his own. This was no longer a Metal Sonic. This was Shard. From here, Shard and the rest of the secret freedom fighters would be sent on a mission to take down the evil wizard who had taken over their kingdom. But even with all of those aforementioned powers and abilities at Shard's disposal, his overconfidence would get the better of him. In their next mission together, Shard, Silver, and Larry Lynx would get into a bit of trouble as they attempted to track down Joffrey St. John, who had been outed as a traitor and as the right-hand man to Nagus, as Shard attempted to brute force his way through a stealth mission. Mission. The skunk never had the skills or abilities like Shard or Silver, but he did have plenty of experience with the Secret Service of the Crown, as well as his Ixus abilities with his training with Nagus. So while Joffrey wouldn't be able to do much in a head-on fight, he was able to slink past the secret freedom fighters and leave them under rubble, something that Shard wasn't fond of, considering he was, you know, buried alive under a volcano and all that. The secret freedom fighters, powerful as they were as individuals, still had a lot to learn in terms of teamwork. Thankfully, they did manage managed to get it together with, ironically enough, a little bit of help from Joffrey himself, and took on Ixus Nagus directly before he could perform a spell on the city council. Shard showed off his many skills here in this battle, and once again did break rank, but thankfully this time it worked out in everyone's favor, as he managed to interrupt Nagus' spell by removing a container of another dead wizard's guts or something like that, and helped save the day. I'm very sorry because if you're not aware of any of the Archie characters or what was going on at this point, point in the canon. I'm sure none of that explanation made any kind of sense. It does deserve a deeper dive, but once again, we're trying to stay focused on one character here. I bring this story up because this is one of the very few times we got to see Shard working alongside the rest of the Secret Freedom Fighters in their own story arc. And it's also important not just to see him with the rest of the team, but also showing what he has to give up and seeing a little bit more into the character. What stings about being a Secret Freedom Fighter is, even when they win, they can never truly be celebrated. They have to stay in the dark, even from those closest to them. That's a sacrifice every member has to make, as we see at the end of this particular story. But what makes Shard interesting is he doesn't have a family to hide from. But we still see him being a peeping Tom as he peers through the window of Uncle Chuck and Sonic's parents. B yes, he does have parents in that canon. <laughs> so yeah, while Shard isn't Sonic, clearly he still yearns for love ones of his own, some sort of familial ties. Chuck holds resentment towards Shard, and the robot is well aware of that. But Chuck was the one that rebuilt Shard and technically gave him a second chance at life. Maybe this is the closest thing Shard can relate to as family. This was a surprising bit of depth to Shard's character, and we would see more hints at his desire to connect with others not too much further from this point. But as interesting as Shard was turning out to be as a character, there was an obvious question that remained in the mind of anyone reading the book at that time. When would Sonic meet Shard? Well, it turns out that particular encounter wasn't too far off either, and probably wasn't a part of the original plan. See, around this time, a rather infamous former writer of Archie had
had settled out of court with the publisher. And while we still don't know the exact details on what was agreed upon, Archie was quick to wipe out any character that Ryder had created, leading to a rushed, chaotic bit of storytelling. And part of that craziness had Sonic, Tails, and Amy taking on a busted metal knuckles that had been hijacked by the mechanical Kruzu Weed, a callback from Sonic the Hedgehog issue 1. This Five Nights at Freddy's reject was giving our heroes a lot of trouble, until a black and yellow striped spin attack shot through the chest of the Kruzu. Shard had arrived on the scene, and to nobody's surprise, the heroes weren't too happy to see the robot. Even with the new paint job, the power gem was an obvious tell to Sonic that this robot was indeed the original Mecha Sonic. And this particular robot had history with all three of these characters. Outside of the obvious connections with Sonic, Tails and Amy had been kidnapped by this very same robot on two separate occasions. So, of course, the heroes assumed Shard was there to cause even more problems. And this once again shows us how much trouble Shard has with taking orders or sticking to plans. Being a secret freedom fighter, he was never supposed to actually interact with Sonic or any of the other heroes. He was on a clandestine mission to back them up if they needed it. But seeing the trouble that they were all in, he decided to jump in. And he did end up regretting that a bit as well, as Sonic, Tails, and Amy immediately sprung to attack the robot. Shard does a decent job of holding them back, but obviously he's not here for a fight. It's not until the Kruzu Metal Knuckles goes back on the offensive do the two hedgehogs decide to call a truce. And in quick fashion, with their combined speed, they drag the weed bot around and set up Tails and Amy to take it out for good reducing it to a single wriggling tendril, which they, uh, <clears throat> jar up, and then hand it off to Shard in hopes to find a way to save Sally, which, yeah, I know, again, I'm skipping a lot of huge plot details. I'm trying my best to keep this focus on Shard, but man, the book was so much fun in these days. Now, you might have also noticed that I went back to calling Shard a Mecha Sonic, and that's because the book did as well. Up to this point, this robot was known as Shard the Mecha. Metal Sonic, but thanks to Sega jumping in and requesting that they stop busting multiple Metal Sonics and establish that there was only one single Metal Sonic, Shard, in turn, had to go back to being referred to as a Mecha Sonic. And to anybody outside of the Sonic community still keeping up with this ridiculous robot naming scheme, bless your soul. But anyway, yeah, the interaction between Sonic and Shard probably happened sooner than the Secret Freedom Fighters or the actual writer intended. But it was still a lot of fun to see. Shard was proving to be a breakout character, and watching these two hedgehogs sass each other was an absolute joy. And honestly, it was kind of nice to see Shard's interactions expand. He was a robot between him looking in on Chuck and teaming up with Sonic himself, and not to mention the growing camaraderie between the other Freedom Fighters and what seemed to be a budding romance between him and Nicole, another AI on the side of good, Shard was starting to come into his own and find his place among the heroes, and I was excited to see these relationships evolve. But unfortunately, all of that would soon be cut short. Like I said just a little bit ago, Sega was growing a bit tired of having multiple Metal Sonics showing up in the book only to be thrashed and replaced with other models. They they wanted one and only one, and they would get just that. In Sonic Universe issue 50, where we have Metal Sonic taking up the entire cover of the book, and by the reflection, you'd be led to believe that this was going to be a fight between him and Sonic, well, that wouldn't be the case at all. This was just a psych out, because as issue 50 opens, we are greeted once again to that first encounter between Shard and the Metal Sonic that had invaded Mobotropolis, where Shard quickly won. But we pull back to see that that this is Eggman reviewing recorded data from the fallen robot. Frustrated with his Metal Sonic failing against the free-thinking Shard, he decided he had to do something about this. Free Will was something he had removed from his badniks to avoid any more of his creations going rogue, but clearly that wasn't working in Metal's favor. So this time, Eggman tried something different. The source of Shard's programming and his extensive abilities all resided in his power gem, something that Robotnik himself gave him way back in that chaotic space. Special. Back then, Eggman had quite a few, but now he only had one power gem left, and he decided to use it on the latest version of Metal Sonic. 
And on top of that, Metal would also be outfitted with all of the battle data from previous failures, which also does help establish that this has been one single Metal Sonic this entire time, even if he has been repaired over and over again. But on top of all of this, Metal Sonic had a new violent edge, as this time Eggman had given him free will, to an extent, as Robotnik had also installed the ability to soft reboot Metal if his defiance ever flared up, as it's quickly demonstrated when Metal refuses to go after Shard, because Shard isn't Sonic and he wants to take on Sonic. But after a quick reboot, Metal agrees to go after the rogue robot, and I do have to wonder if this was also added to help set up a Sonic Heroes Neo Metal kind of storyline, but I digress, again this video is about Shard. The comic briefly turns its attention towards Sonic, Tails, and Amy discussing their recent run-in with Shard. Sonic was genuinely thankful for the robot's help, but considering Shard's past and just how many other evil versions of the Hedgehog are out there, Sonic can't help but worry. As he says, that's a lot of power in the hands of somebody still figuring out whether they're on the side of good or evil. To be completely fair to Sonic, he had only interacted with Shard one single time, so it's understandable why he was trepidatious. But for any reader that's been keeping up with the story, it's it's obvious that Shard had proven plenty that he was indeed a good guy, and this story would only solidify that, as we turn our attention to the robot himself, in a virtual reality battle simulation. At least, that's what it looks like at the start of the page. It's actually just a game of chess between himself and Nicole. The Digital Lynx had take notice to the amount of time Shard comes to visit her, and while she is thankful for the company, she does ask why he doesn't interact more with the real world. And here with Nicole, Shard does open up a bit about his insecurities and his loneliness. He has to live in secret, and even if he didn't, he's only ever been known as a killer robot. He clearly is a social butterfly, he'd love to make these connections, but he's just not ready. And Nicole disagrees, reassuring Shard of his good nature and how highly the other secret freedom fighters think of him. He's not just a tool, he is an important member of his team. And she can even relate to building up trust with the public, as there was a time when she was overridden by an evil force. But Shard points points out that she has a long history with the Freedom Fighters, heroes that would back her up, and they have only ever known him as an enemy outside of that brief encounter with Sonic recently. Not only that, the city was just attacked by a Metal Sonic, and that's probably all the citizens would see if he ever became public. And we even see hints of feelings towards Nicole near the end of the page. But before Shard can lay down the charm, Nicole's proximity alert goes off. Her AI does serve as protection for the city of Mobotropolis, and it turns out Metal Sonic had breached Nicole's defenses and quickly teared through the city to take a hostage. She had already alerted Team Freedom, the half of the Freedom Fighters that had stayed to protect the city while Sonic, Tails, and Amy were off on adventures to help save Sally, but as capable as they were, none of them are as fast as Sonic. They wouldn't get there fast enough, and as Shard says, they aren't dealing with just some regular old badnik. He should know. He unplugs himself from the VR and launches off, quickly finding himself in front of Metal Sonic, who had broken into the Mobotropolis hospital, holding up a badly damaged and comatose Antoine. Previously, Metal Sonic had self-destructed and hospitalized Antoine, and this newly rebuilt robot was here to finish the job. Well, not exactly. This was bait to bring out Shard from hiding, and that obviously worked. Still, no reason why Metal wouldn't just finish off Antoine here and now, but Shard calls him out, saying that Antoine is no challenge, but Shard is, and Metal agrees, and the two robots fly off to a battlefield just as they miss Team Freedom's arrival. Shard leads them to the Great Wastes, the former site of Knothole Village, far away from any potential casualties and also far away from any potential backup or help. As they fly to the battleground, Shard can tell there's more to Metal this time than their previous encounter. There's a spark, a sense of self, and Shard does his best to reason with his evil duplicate, but it proves futile, and a fight quickly breaks out. And unlike last time, Metal Sonic is ready. The two robots trade violent, powerful blows, and all of those broken abilities we mentioned before all come out to play. The transforming arm, the plasma blasts, even one coming directly from Shard's power core, all of these things that he had used himself to walk all over Sonic back in the day. This was an arsenal superior to Metal's, but thanks to all of that previous battle data and now the extra help of quick thinking, Metal quickly evens 
evens the playing field, jamming a sharp rock into Shard's arm cannon just as he fires, jamming it. Shard then resorts to a classic spin attack, but Metal's Dark Shield blocks it, and then retaliates with a spin of his own. As impressive as all of his skills and armaments were over the years, in a short, brutal fight, this new Metal Sonic has matched and outclassed everything Shard has thrown his way. But Shard still fights. He shoots the Lodge Rock out of his arm cannon, severely damaging it. But Metal uses his own energy beam to disintegrate the rock in mid-air. Metal walks over to the collapsed Shard and holds him up by the neck. And Shard still attempts to plead with Metal, saying that there's more to life than his core programming. There's more to life than just wanting to destroy Sonic. Metal can be his own person. I mean, if there was any other character that could relate to this robot, it would be Shard. He was literally once this very model, and he is living proof that he can be more than whatever Robotnik tells him to do. And in a brief flash, Metal recalls a memory of Shadow telling him something similar. But thanks to that Defiant Soft reboot, Metal quickly shakes it off, saying that all that matters is the target and eliminating said target. But even in this thrash state, Shard still takes pity on Metal Sonic, saying that there is no hope for Metal to become anything more than what he is. Eggman robbed him of that chance. And realizing this, Shard also knows knows that if he doesn't stop Metal Sonic here and now, there won't be anything stopping this killer robot from returning to Mobotropolis with that new powered up gem and killing off the rest of the citizens while Sonic is away. And with that acceptance, and the short chat giving Shard enough time to repair his arm, he doubles down on his attack, no longer holding back going after Metal Sonic's power gem with a drill, trying to pin the evil robot down. But Metal had quite enough of this adapting arm and activates his burst shield, slicing Shard's arm off completely. But Shard keeps going, blasting across the waist with Metal, still grabbing for that power core. And Metal, realizing that this power gem was his weak point, decides to rid himself of it and Shard at the same time, initiating a self-destruct that takes out his own power gem, and also cracks shards. As the dust clears, we can see that the heroic hedgehog bot did end up surviving the blast, at least for a little while. He is now heavily damaged, potentially far beyond his own auto repairs. He can't even move, and with the last little bit of energy he has left, he calls Nicole, saying that Metal Sonic had been taken out. Not technically by shard, but he's still taking that win. Trying to stay in high spirits despite the fact that he's not in great shape, barely getting words out as Nicole tells him that help is on the way, but they might not be there fast enough. As he fades out of consciousness, Shard tries his best to warn Nicole that Metal Sonic is now far more dangerous than ever before, and he will be back. And after that warning, he tries to say something to Nicole herself, but before the sentence can be finished, it ends in static, and the page itself ends focused on the cracked power core of Shard. The next page would show us a rebuilt Metal Sonic, stating that while he'd lost his own power gem, he was victorious in taking out the rogue robot. And obviously Metal Sonic would carry on in that continuity and the next and everywhere else. But that would be the last we would see of Shard. His story, like his final words, would go unfinished. It's hard to say if there would be any other plans for the character after that point. I believe Ian Flynn in a Bumblecast said that they didn't have anything set up after that story. I could be wrong and if he ever gets a chance to do his lost hedgehog tales he keeps mentioning, I hope they do continue that story. As it is, we have no idea if they just hadn't figured out what was next for Shard or if they meant to conclude his story here in issue 50. Either way, the canon kind of imploded in on itself after that point. Shard was nowhere to be seen in the rebooted universe, and obviously, once Archie and Sega parted ways, so too ended any chance of seeing Shard in any official capacity. And that is a shame. Flynn's run on Archie Archie has some hits and misses for sure, but a lot of those messier parts were largely due to outside forces messing with the very continuity of the book. I'd still argue, even with that considered, these are still some of the greatest stories told in any part of the Sonic franchise, and Shard was intertwined with a great deal of that. But unfortunately, that also means the robot ended up being one of the many victims who had a tail cut too short. He was a great addition to the Secret Freedom Fighters. Hell, a great addition to Archie Sonic. And only at the 
end did we really see him begin to form friendships and feelings, which makes that final fight with Metal Sonic all the more heartbreaking, but at the same time, that much more impactful. You have heard me complain about this robot every time he showed back up after issue 25. Like I keep saying, Metal Sonic is one of my absolute favorite characters in this franchise, and it was always such a rare treat to see him back in the day. And Archie always managed to ruin it in the brief sporadic times he would show up. I wasn't kidding when I said that literally one of the reasons I gave up on the book was because of bad Metal Sonic designs. And I've seen you guys on Twitter. I know plenty of you get just as uppity about mischaracterization and bad designs or long quills, green eyes, any of that stuff. This stuff matters to us. But once again, as I always say and always appreciate about Flynn, Yardley, and the rest of the team that took up the comic mantle after issue 160, they constantly showed that even bad ideas can be salvaged and rebuilt into something incredible. It's amazing that I can look back at all of these frustrating moments from my childhood, this bloaty, terrible design from Chaotix, and the weird cone-shaped quills from issues 87 and 88, and instead of looking back on them and just seeing mistakes or a misunderstanding of what these characters are supposed to be, I instead see what I think the creative team saw, stepping stones to something greater. Flynn gets a lot of hate from some older Archie fans saying that he disrespects a lot of the work from previous writers, but I disagree, and I think Shard is a great example of this. Because if it was up to me, I would have never touched that robot again. But Flynn not only brought him back, but they showed a lot of appreciation for his journey. I think it's kind of great that one of the very first times we saw robots rebel against Robotnik was in that Knuckles Chaotic special with Heavy and Bomb. And yeah, just like Metal, I hated their original comic designs too. But I also think it's amazing that the first time we saw Shard in action, it was to save those two very same robots he fought against in that special. This truly was a story of redemption. Shard was, at more than a few points, one of the reasons I loathe Archie Sonic and he still managed to become one of my favorite designs and, yeah, one of my favorite characters. No, he didn't get a lot of time to shine, but when he did, that black and yellow coat glimmered bright. And what an incredible evolution for Metal Sonic, of all characters. I do still think the spirit of him lives on, at least in a sense of Scrap Nick's Mecha Sonic, as we do see a similar story of growth, letting go of your past, and moving on into something greater. And yeah, I do still love Metal Sonic, Sonic as he is. I mean, clearly, I grew up my whole life wanting him to be this one particular thing, and nowadays, Metal is exactly that. I no longer have to wait literal years between appearances. He's everywhere, and he's back to being creepy, silent, and dangerous, but he's also forever unchanging. And while I have been fine with that, nowadays I can't help but wonder, what else could he be? Yeah, he could be more evil. We have seen him turn big and red, and one time he had a cape with more spikes and all that stuff was cool and I would argue also could be expanded on because let's be real, I would be amazed if Sega ever went down those paths ever again with this character, but one I never expected them to ever allow and one I never really thought of myself until I saw it on the pages was a story that asked the question, what if Metal Sonic became a good guy? And while the time was brief and definitely deserved a lot more exploring, the answer as it turns out out is something pretty special. And that is going to do it for today, guys. Thank you so much for sticking around. I know I normally wait for a particular marathon to talk about these robots, but life has been what it is, and I never really got around to this in March, so... Eh, whatever. I'm the only one putting restrictions on myself, so I figured, what the heck, let's talk about Shard for a bit. I've been wanting to for a very long time. I will, of course, get into more detail of those stories themselves as we cover it in Sonic Speed Reading, but I did want to cover a character that had spanned the entire history of that book. Because so often I just see people talk about Archie being this weird bad time or it's only associated with lawsuits and other such nonsense, but there is stuff worth celebrating and there are a few 
two characters quite as interesting as Shard. So if you've never heard of him before, I hope that does spark your own interest. I hope you do give that old book a chance and see that there is a lot of cool stuff there. And really, I do have to thank my buddy Channel Pup, not only for helping me edit this video, but for also actually bringing up the idea of doing a little bit more with Metal Sonic, as he'd done over on Sunset City quite a while ago. Did argue with him plenty about it, but it did help remind me of this particular character and his incredible journey. Because yeah, Shard technically isn't the way I would take Metal Sonic myself, but the fact of the matter is there are a bunch of Sonic robots out there, so why not get a little creative with their stories? And really, there are very few, if any, robots that can really match the journey of Shard. But yeah, thank you for sticking around, and thank you so much to the patrons who help support the channel. There's links below if you'd like to join in as well. You can get access to our Discord and get videos early, fun stuff like that. And an extra special shout out to these folks here. Kyle Winter, Cyrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Josh Strider, Monroe the Metal Hyena, Faison Razul, Hatsworth, Tiny Jericho, Ginger Bob, Jack of All Spades, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Quote, Resident Fanboy, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Mr. Boo J, Sam Webster, Fish Flop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Jonathan Dobbs, Haley, Dr. SP, here is your PSA for the week, Americans act responsibly over the three-day weekend, everyone else, just Monday, tell how delayed <laughs> This Patreon read is. Sorry about that, guys. Cecil the Gallade, The Dark Neon, Stefan Plakonica, Three Monic, Graham J. Hall, Lenny X, Wayne is Boss, Lederick. Welcome to the mind of a different kind where we've been game apologizing, apologizing, steadily. Coryeth 20 covers. Hi, Nick. Hi, David. Jimmy Duke, STR, NBTV, Mute, Trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com, Jim Sayotome, Boten, I'm not reading that, Enerjack 5, Spades the Nocturne, Ken K, then 101, Paxton Bisbee, Sindarin 7, a small ickle bickle bunby who is staring at you. Stop thinking about the knife. It's rude. 3 Rule 4, Twilord. I love the Boss Baby movies. I'm their biggest fan. Paisley, Eric Delgado, Kodinsky, Jamo Art, Sayonara, Robocop, Crimson Rose, Give Up Your Children, Separate, Sonic PAJ, Moonicent, Godzilla, Makuta of Salt, Gleam the Anomaly, Alexander Watson, Clay Presley, Neil Gon Kampa, Conan Kudo, Sharif Pai, Infamous.jpg, The Lex, The Most Powerful Ship in the Two Universes, Native Nerd 27, Kaido Prower, Matt the Hedgehog, Now Play Pointy Sonic and Fluffy Tails. It's good for the soul. Swift Cannon, Spearmint, Gender Swap Tails is the best female Sonic character, and I will fight you if you claim otherwise. Okay. Omega Man 21, Pen Adelaide, Other Envelope, Roski, and The Phantomist. Seen some new names on here. Thank you guys so much for pitching in. And like I always have to say, if I'm mispronouncing any of these names, please just send me a message and I'll be sure to correct myself. Thank you guys so much for your patience. I know it's been a long time since I've released the video. I'm going to try and get back on track here. So stay tuned because we'll have something up very soon. But until next time, toot toot Sonic Warriors.